Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. You can hear me. <laughs> I'll speak louder. Um, welcome to Central Synagogue. If this is your first time or if this is your millionth time, my name is Marina Nebro, and I'm the program manager for adult programs here at Central Synagogue. Um, I say hello from Rabbi Berman, um, who is our director of adult education here. She is currently on vacation. Um, and I thank you for coming to this program. Um, and um, I want to jump right into it because we have a lot to cover and we also have President Biden's speech to watch. Um, so I'm not going to waste too much time. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, two of our speakers and then hand it over to our facilitator. Um, so first, um, I want to welcome Jonathan Ornstein, the CEO of the JCC in Krakow, an organization devoted to rebuilding Jewish life in the city. Prior to beginning his role at the JCC in 2008, Jonathan was a lecturer in Jewish studies and founded the Gesher Association for Polish-Israeli Dialogue. He is a founding member of the Krakow Association of Christians and Jews and also serves on the board of the Krakow branch of the Child Survivors of the Holocaust Organization, Hillel Poland, JCC Global, and the Abraham Global Peace Initiative. A native New Yorker, Jonathan moved to Israel and served in the IDF before moving to Poland. So thank you for joining us. Um, and next to him we have Chuck Fishman, a photographer focusing on social and political issues around the world with a strong humanistic concern and focus. Fishman's work has appeared on the covers of Time, Life, Fortune, Newsweek, and numerous other publications, and is in the collections of museums such as the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery and the Studio Museum in Harlem, just to name a few. His photographs are on view for the next month in our exhibition here in the pavilion, Solitude to Solidarity, Ukrainians Finding Refuge at JCC Krakow. And these photos are only a small snapshot of his latest photography book, 80 Years Later, JCC Krakow's Response to the War in Ukraine, which is also the title of tonight's program. Um, so I am going to hand it over to our facilitator, Amanda Moskowitz, to um, lead the rest of today's conversation. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Marina. Uh, my name is Amanda Moskowitz. I am only here because I have experience moderating, uh, and I happen to be Jewish, and I've crashed several of your high holiday services. <laughs> so thank you. I'm an old friend of Sarah Berman's, Rabbi Sarah, and we have spoken so many times about organizing interesting conversations, because it's something we both do and I'm so flattered to be invited. Um, as Marina said, we might be cutting out a little early, so I'm gonna kind of rearrange some of my questions to make sure we, we hit the important points. Originally, I started out thinking we should address some of the bewildering events of the past two weeks. We're gonna have that in this conversation as we bring in President Biden's speech. So if it's okay with the audience, we'll hold a place for that for a few moments uh, later and uh, kind of go straight to the amazing work of both of these gentlemen. Um, I've so enjoyed researching both of you and your work and getting to know it, and thank you both for what you've contributed. To, to begin, I would just like to begin in this space with these pictures. Chuck, to you first. When people stand up tonight um, and look around after this conversation, what is one picture that you would really photograph that you would like them to look at that really means something special to you? That one. That one. That one. Why that one? Um, that, that's actually the cover of the book uh, that Jonathan was holding up somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it speaks to what the situation was and, and, and is. Uh, it's a young woman with her uh, youngest baby, who was one year, one year old, in a shelter uh, near the Krakow train station that JCC Krakow was helping provide monetary funds along with four other groups. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and this was a very temporary shelter for people with one or two nights to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, they were, she had two other children. Uh, she had her husband, which is highly unusual because you know, men of military age are not allowed to leave Ukraine, but he actually was there, and after I was photographing her, he came over to me and talked to me in English, mm. and I was, ast I was astounded that this man could even be there, and he explained that they were trying to get to Canada, uh, and then I got his email address, and, uh, and we communicated, uh, and when I let them know, I wanted to make sure that they, they are there now, they're in Quebec, they have a new life, uh, family with her mother, and uh, but just the the entire the entire situation. It, it's obvious. Obviously, there's a mattress that's on a floor in an 80 bed former theater that was turned into an emergency shelter, uh, and um, just the the look, the expression, the uh, what's what's available in the picture to see. I think can tell a lot, depending, of course, of what you bring to it. I would add, just composition-wise, it's a really spectacular picture. Just, uh, it's. Um, I would also note that, like, looking at your collections from the 1970s, I don't know if it's is it because of your eye or the nature of the content that it kind of looks like it. This could be a picture from 1975, or the. It, this seems like a timeless picture. Well, Photograph. Well, is it bad for me to call it a picture? It's a picture. <laughs> okay. It's a picture. It's a snap. It's, um, it's, they're all historical. Everything, yeah. every, every photograph made is really history, unless it's possibly a still life in a, in a studio. But it's all part of history. And I prefer working in black and white on my personal work, and I consider that this my personal work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I prefer to make my own prints uh, in silver um, when I can. And uh, it's going into a situation to photograph, it's like, what, what do you bring to it? What do you see? How do you feel about it? What do you want to show? Uh, what can you show if you can show anything? Um, can you even get your film out? Can, can anyone else even see it? Do you want to share it with people or do you want to keep it strictly to yourself? Uh, pictures that I made from 1978 to 1983, I shared with no one until 10 years ago. I yeah. archived those pictures. My first uh, set of pictures from 1975, um, that became a book, Polish Jews, the final chapter, which is what it was supposed to have been, as yeah. well as pictures from 78 to 83. But with the fall of communism, history took an about turn. Yeah. And, and without that, it would have been the yeah. end of a thousand year history of Polish Jewry. J Jonathan, what photograph in the room kind of exemplifies the collection to you? Um, there's a photograph, I'm not sure, I think it's over there on the mm -hmm. side, Chuck, with the, no, no. The yo-yos. The yo-yos. There's a photograph which is the back cover of the book, and I think the fact that he chose the front cover and I chose the photo that's on the back cover probably explains why one is the front cover and one is the back cover. Um, but as Chuck mentioned, you're talking about a uh, population of women and children and as somebody who has a small child I think things that are you know photographs of children or the plight of the children is something that resonates with me or maybe strikes me a little bit harder than than it does uh, than the other photos and you know I think also the you know this uh, the very obvious metaphor of the yo-yos is that yep. you know that, that's such a beautiful picture different, right which is an amazing photo um, you know, Chuck, Chuck is absolutely amazing. And uh, to capture that and, you know, that their lives are, that's their lives, right? I don't think you see such an obvious, you know, most photos are not as obvious and clear a message as the kids playing with the yo-yos as they've just, playing with yo-yos when they've just had to leave their homes and their lives are very much up and down and uncertain and are, and I think, you know, the way that a yo-yo is, your, the string is being pulled by, by somebody else externally. And that, to me, really resonates, uh, that their lives are like that, that, not dependent on themselves yet. No. Also, kids will find toys and ways to have fun, which I, I say with a, a little humor, but it's mostly true. And I think it's a beautiful thing about the resilience of these children. Um, I want to speak to what has happened 
between Chuck, when, when you started photographing the community of Jewish people in Krakow to now. Now we are talking about a community that is focusing on outreach to people in need. But in the mid 70s, there was nothing and you thought you were capturing the end of something. Well, in, I was. It was to be the end of the survivors, of, of the people who actually lived through the Shoah. Can you all just, just closer? Yeah. Lived through the Shoah, the, the Holocaust, World War II. Whether they escaped uh, by going east, which is the majority of how the majority of, of Jews survived by, by being basically kidnapped east, and then um, with Stalin taking them to Siberia, where people died, but they were kept alive, mostly. Uh, and that's how the majority of, of Polish Jewish survivors lived. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was first there in 75, I thought it was gonna be one time only. I, I didn't know I'd ever come back. Uh, three and a half years later, I was back as a working professional photographer and, and knowing that I'd be there, I sought out the Jewish community because I, I had met some of these people, men, because they were primarily older men, younger than what I am now, but they were old men. Uh, and, uh, and they were there because they had no place else to go. They were pensioners, and, and they were gonna die there, and it was understood globally that one, once that generation dies out, it's over, it's over, we're finished. It's the end of a thousand years. It's basically turn off the lights. It's over, it's, it's ended. Um, that was from 75 to 83. I didn't go back then again until 2013, 30 years later, to a whole new world, a whole new world. Not only was Poland a democratic country, uh, with ATM machines and, and which you know and 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 uh, Newsweek and Time magazine. I mean, it, things that people who'd never lived under communism can't comprehend. You know, forget internet. It was just, just, just general information and lie and life. Uh, I came back to a vibrant Jewish community, small but vibrant and growing. And Jonathan, how did? The Polish, I mean, this is a lesson in history a little bit, but how did the rebirth of the Polish Jewish community happen? Uh, well, I think the thing to, to understand is that there was a lot more Jewish life going on than it seemed. So what Chuck found was the sort of visible tip of the iceberg. Um, and there were a lot of people who had gone underground, who had hid their identity during, especially the 70s and 80s. And then when communism ended in 1989, two things began, or continued, or accelerated, let's say. One is that Poles, non-Jewish Poles, became very interested in everything Jewish. So they start to write books and play klezmer music, and uh, you know, this idea that the, Jews, the heart, Jewish heart was ripped out of Poland, and then during the 45 years of communism, nobody really was free to speak about it because they were controlled by the Soviet Union. Mm. Um, so in 1989, non-Jewish Poles, through their interest mm. in Jewish subjects, including you know, Krakow is a good example. The largest Jewish culture festival in the world is in Krakow mm. in its 33rd year, founded by two non-Jews uh, in the late 80s, one mm. of whom is still running it. Mm. So it's not the most obvious place for the largest Jewish culture festival in the world, the place that we associate almost exclusively with loss and tragedy of the Holocaust. So that backdrop has led to really what's happening now, which are the children, grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren of the Holocaust survivors who stayed the ones who didn't leave uh, are now finding out they're Jewish and more importantly are acting upon it, right? If you find out you're Jewish and it's a scary situation, you're probably not going to take those steps into a JCC or a synagogue or join Hillel or these organizations that we've now set up in Poland. Uh, so th really those two things working together because you have the raw material, these people that have Jewish roots that are there. but only because of this environment that's conducive to Jewish life because of Polish non-Jews, then those things working together mean that people find out they're Jewish, they look around, they see a country that's generally interested in all things Jewish, and that allows them to come and reconnect to the, to, and join the community. It's kind of a fascinating contrast to what we think about with Jewish assimilation in other parts of the world where Jewish culture is lost as a means of survival. Um, as you went through these years, going back so many times, can you tell us about, I watched a YouTube video where you took us through some of your exhibitions and those moments that punctuated the years, signs that Jewish life was coming back, 
Can you tell us about some of those? Uh, one of them, actually Jonathan referred to, was um, uh, one picture from the Jewish Culture Festival uh, in 2014. It was my second trip back. 2013 was the first. One year later, I was back again, and I photographed, uh, amongst other things, the Jewish Culture Festival. Um, which is in the loop. That yeah. One of those pictures is in the loop that actually was going around. Uh, and that picture is a massive, thousands of people in what's called Shiroka Square or Shiroka Street, which is this big um, plaza yeah. uh, in Kazimierz, the former uh, Jewish district, the Jewish district um, <laughs> in, in Krakow, where, where within a, a seven minute walk yeah. ar around the JCC, you can go to 10, how many? In a 10 minute walk, seven synagogues. In a 10 minute walk, you can hit seven synagogues, a couple that are, couple that are actually still, actually um, perform, uh, have services, mm -hmm. uh, still functioning, um, and, and these synagogues, they go back hundreds of years, not yeah. tens <laughs> you know, yeah. or 20, but hundreds of years. Um, uh, so the 2014, that's, that's the Jewish Culture Festival. But I've been back, I have photographed circumcisions, Brit Milas yeah. uh, for Jewish babies mm. um, in both Krakow and Warsaw. Uh, I mean, that's Jewish life continuing. And, 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 but so there are, there are literally babies being born as Polish Jews yeah. from the get-go. Yeah. Uh, it's not as if, you know, so maybe their, their mother or their grandmother or whatever had a relative, but they're now being born and bred as Polish Jews, growing up in Poland, in a free democratic Poland, which looks like, to get slightly political, will be getting better now since the elections yes, a couple yeah, days ago. Yeah. So it's even better for the Jews. You know, the question, is it good for the Jews? Yeah. 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 Um, I want to stay on this track because I'm also thinking of other questions <laughs> right now that are so interesting. Um, I mean, there are just so many directions we can take this conversation, but we do have an agenda. So I, I want to bring it back to what about these events? What is the equation or combination of things? Why does the JCC, what makes it time for a JCC to come? Um, the early aughts, what's happening, and, and I mean, honestly, in the room, I don't know what has to crystallize in a community to make it a good place for a JCC. Um, if, is that common? Is it rare? And so why Krakow? You need, a, 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 you need the King of England to visit and decide to help your community get a JCC, which was okay. what happened. So it wasn't, you know, normally to get a project built, you have a need, a, a proven need, and then you go to people who can help you realize that goal. We need a school, we have too many kids in one school, we have to build a new school. It's the way that things work in Krakow. Uh, the Prince of Wales had, when he was Prince of Wales, visited Krakow, met with some survivors, was moved by their story, wanted to help them. And the idea of a survivor, uh, a, a senior center for Holocaust survivors grew into the idea of the JCC when the prince was made aware of the fact that young people were starting to find out about their Jewish identities, mm -hmm. and that maybe this center can not only take care of Holocaust survivors, which we are, but also maybe serve as a catalyst to rebuild Jewish life, to give a community hope, a community that was just there. You know, there, 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 wasn't, there was no idea of a future. I got to Poland in 2002. People were taking care, making sure, let's make sure this happens, let's make sure that happens, but nobody was really boldly saying, Poland can have a Jewish future. And Prince Charles liked that idea and got involved. And uh, in 2008, the JCC opened, was opened by him and by the- By you. By me, but for, uh, as well, but you know, by Prince Charles, it's a better- Tell us about these years. So the center has been open for 15 years. Uh, almost everything going on in our Jewish community in Krakow is centered at the center. So it means a, uh, an, a uh, Sunday school, it means a preschool, which is the first Jewish preschool, community preschool to open in Krakow since, since the war, since the Holocaust. BBYO, Hillel is run through our JCC. We have about 50 Holocaust survivors that we're taking care of. Uh, there's no federation, there's no Jewish family services, there's no self-help. That means that we are the primary uh, caregivers for 50 Holocaust survivors. We have Shabbat dinner every week. Um, in a community, if you Google how many Jews are in Krakow, it says usually there are 100 Jews in Krakow. And we have at this point 850 Jewish members 
um, 100, 120 people for Shabbat dinner is an average week. We have about 300, 400 people studying Hebrew, most of them non-Jews, um, publish a newspaper, have a choir, um, have a genealogist, so really one-stop shopping for everything going on in a Jewish community. Uh, and on top of that, and I think very importantly, we have 100, maybe 120,000, depends on the year, visitors come through our building every year. Um, and there's not necessarily something to see. They're coming through, or you know, an exhibition, it's not a museum. All these visitors, many of them Jewish, are coming through because of the interest, the importance of this idea of Poland not only being a place of Jewish tragedy and of Jewish death, but a place of Poland once again becoming a place of Jewish life. It used to be that people would come to Poland and it was Auschwitz period, and now we say it's Auschwitz comma. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference. Back to Chuck, I want to bring it to the current day, or, or the past 18 months anyway. Um, what is important about the Ukrainian refugees in the context of JCC Krakow, or vice versa? Why tell this story about JCC Krakow in the context of the Ukrainian refugees? What is this mix that's important to your story? It's pure Judaism. It's Judaism at its heart. It's tikkun olam. Uh, it's the essence of any major religion do unto others. Uh, JCC Krakow, under this man's guidance, uh, stood up. They stood up and said, no, 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 like basically, not on our watch. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do? These are innocent people. These are innocent women and children primarily, and, and the overwhelming majority, not Jewish. Most, maybe not even knowing what JCC even means, mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly there's there's an out, there's a hand helping. There's food provided. There's clothing. There's there's um, sanitary items. There's yo-yos for children to play in a courtyard safely, uh, without hearing bombs going off or anything else. Uh, it's um, it was it was a true essence of tikkun olam. Um, just to go back in time, uh, this was this happened basically. We were in two years into COVID, uh, and um, and I hadn't almost left my house in two years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one morning, I got a message from my friend, basically saying, "Why aren't you here, documenting and photographing the uh, Ukrainian refugees?" And I wrote him back because I'm not a news photographer, and I don't do that stuff, and I'm not a war photographer. It, it makes no difference to me. I love conversations that begin like this. Why aren't you here? Right. Why aren't you here? <laughs> and, but, and he wrote back. He goes, no, you missed the point. These are survivors saving survivors. Yeah. It's beautiful and symmetrical. That's mm -hmm. a quote. He got, and that got me. Because mm -hmm. then I realized, OK, this is something. I can bear witness. I can help, possibly. Uh, there can, uh, there's a possibility that there will be, um, uh, people will take notice, uh, you know, perhaps, that can raise, and that can raise awareness, that could possibly raise consciousness, that could then possibly raise funds and put people into action. Yeah. And that's what this was all about. Uh, so I was so, after another COVID booster and two and a half weeks later, I was photographing <laughs> These things. Yeah. Uh, this is the preschool. This is Frida. This is the uh, nursery school. And oh. That's a Ukrainian refugee girl in the flowered headband. Um, who, who, and this is uh, attending the JCC Crack of Nursery School. Uh -huh. uh, so there's amazing, amazing things that were happening as, as a helping hand, just yeah. really, truly to help innocent people. Yeah. And I, was, and I just wanted, I wanted that. Jonathan, this has to. I mean, it sounds immensely rewarding and an amazing experience, also very taxing and hard to do. So t talk to us about all of that, leading what must be kind of like a fundamentally different organization when you go into support mode like this. Yeah, so we had no experience really in, in being a humanitarian aid organization. I think we had the most important um, aspect of that, though. We had motivation. We wanted to do that. We made a decision the first day of the war, that we were going to do all we could to help Ukraine, and that we take that very literally, all we could. And the second decision was that we were going to help Jews and non-Jews equally. And, I, and I, I add equally just because you can be a Jewish organization, you can set up a system to help Jews, which is, you know, what we should be. Of course, you have to help your own. And then the occasional non-Jew 
walks in and you help them a little bit and then you get to feel, get to tell the world that you're helping everybody. And we, because of the history of where we are, because of the help that we essentially did not receive 80 years earlier, our community felt the responsibility to do things on a bit of a different scale. So we, uh, it's been incredibly challenging. We've set up, uh, I mean, dozens, literally dozens of programs inside Ukraine, on the border, in Krakow. Now we're primarily 20 months into this, I guess, focused on, on Krakow. We're still um, supporting about uh, 700 people a day, 98% of whom are not Jewish. Um, we were 35 full-time employees before the war. Uh, I think we were, the, before the war, the largest Jewish organization in Poland. We are now 70 full-time employees. We, within two weeks, doubled in size. Mm. And we have distributed uh, about $10 million uh, in aid mm. so far, which is five times our mm. annual um, budget. So it's been uh, very challenging. It's primarily, we have over 5,000 donors. So it's a lot of asking and begging and groveling, but people have responded. And I think the Jewish world understands how important this is, has understood. Of course, there are other priorities as well, especially now. But the idea of, I think, for our community coming full circle, this community that within living memories, living memory were victims and were victims of the worst, possibly the worst thing that ever happened to our people or any other people. And those same people themselves as children who received help are now in a position to be part of a community that's reaching out and helping others. And that's, you know, there's something really, I think, important and empowering about that. Not only do something that's nice, you know, what is the sign of maturity for a community? Perhaps going from those who need help to be in this position of helping others, I think, is a real sign that our community has, I don't want to say arrived, we're not New York City, but we're well on our way. Yeah, I'm tempted to like still drill down on that further. Like in 25 years, how will this experience have changed? What will we be talking about? The changes that this experience made both for the Jewish community in Poland, but also for, it sounds like Poland in general. And Jew um, it, it just, it just feel, feels like there's going to be long lasting significance and impact. Yeah, first thing, I hope the war isn't still going on 25 oh, yeah, years from now I, is my primary. The way things are going, we don't, you yeah. know, it's hard for us to see an end. But absolutely, you know, this, this, this effort was led by our Holocaust survivors who stood up literally and said, this is not okay. This is what happened to us 75, 80 years ago, and we need to do all we can. And our, what it means for these young people that are finding out they're Jewish, that they then are in a position not only to seek handouts from the rest of the Jewish world, oh, people come visit us in Poland, and oh my God, you're in Poland, how can you live here, and here, we'll, we'll help you, is important and nice, but the idea that they themselves, that our young people are now in a position to help others, I think is incredibly important for them to see their place in the Jewish world. What we're trying to do is to say to the Jewish world, Poland, yes, terrible things happened in Poland, but we have to take a few steps back and understand a thousand years of history. And now what we're able to do in Poland to help others is, is, is a sign that we're far more connected to the Jewish world than perhaps people realized. Uh, Jonathan. What lessons have you learned over the past two years? that you would share with people, a country, communities who are suffering? What would you share, just the lessons? We're in this, we're all in this in some capacity. Uh, I guess two things, one is not to be indifferent. There will always be bad people, if you wanna put it in a plain term like that, and there'll always be good people. And the world, the history of the world will be determined by those on the sidelines and whether they turn a blind eye or whether they get involved and, and, and choose to take part and try to fix things. And that's not an incredibly complicated concept, but it's something in practice that's very difficult to do. Um, I think we Jews, because of our history, it can kind of go either way. The way to respond to genocide, and we've been genocide perpetrated on us in living memory. 
That's a very, very powerful thing. Um, and one thing that can do can make us bitter and make us angry, which is logical and perhaps expected. But another thing it can make us do is make us empathetic and make us realize that because we've felt this and our community has felt this, then perhaps it gives us a particular responsibility to prevent others from feeling what we've felt. And I hope that that is the lesson for all of us, for the Jewish people. I know that that's the lesson for our community. Um, and I think the second part of that is really connected, but about the other, right? At times, when times are difficult, we turn inward. We're tribal. This is deep in our, in our brains. And it's hard not to do that. But I think it behooves us to make an effort to continue to help the other and not lose the essential part of what makes us Jewish. And I think that, in my opinion, what one of the primary things that makes us Jewish is the idea of, that Chuck mentioned, is tikkun olam. The world is a broken place and we must repair it. And the world is a broken place and we must repair it, not unless bad things happen to us, but perhaps even more so because we have been on the receiving end so much, uh, so often, and you know, especially lately, which has been difficult to do, to, to see. That was beautifully put. Um, and I think it's the horrible balance that a lot of people in Israel are facing right now, is how to be both protective and survive, and also how to give. I would also add, Jonathan, that you know, in prior to President Biden's speech, you were talking a lot of, you know, in, in Chuck too, about community and how the lines between who's Jewish and who's not Jewish have blurred in Poland specifically, the culture permeating through non-Jewish parts of Poland, um, bringing in Ukrainian refugees, being expansive about our culture and resisting that when possible, the urge to turn inward, which I think is important right now. I know I've faced that in the past two weeks in a way I have never before um, felt like, okay, just Jews will understand this, and I don't think that's true. But that urge is there to think that. Chuck, um, what's kind of your take? I, and, and we can just bring it more explicitly back to the speech if you'd like to. Um, you know, what's your take on the lessons that you've learned? Or you can speak to the speech. I, I don't want to be awkward or too <laughs> about bringing it in. I know we might want to talk about that now. Uh, I can't um, speak over what Jonathan just said. Yeah. I mean, he, he encapsulated so much. Um, for me, what President Biden just did was just perfectly right on, just the way it should be done by a true leader. Um, what happens now? We don't know. We, we never really know what's going to happen, uh, whether it's outside, outside in, this, in this city or, or around the world. We don't know. Um, it's day by day. You, you do what you can do. You try and live your life, your life or your lives the way, uh, hopefully, to be better and to help. What is the role of religion in helping in, in community? I, when it comes to helping, I, I, I grew up in North Carolina, in like not good North Carolina. Um, <laughs> and we like rarely had a minion on Shabbat. Um, and, and that's like a liberal minion. Um, and my siblings and I, yes, like we were the first Jewish people many, many had ever seen. Um, there were stupid comments here and there, but largely we had an extremely happy, and we love where we're from, and we grew up in a very happy home and a happy community. We did all of our activities through churches. We were welcome, we did theater, we did all of our soccer. Religion is key here. 
And I still haven't really broken down for myself what the role of religion in all of this is. But it's, what is it to you all? Well, we might have a debate on this, but uh, as far as religion itself, I don't think living a religious life is, is, um, is necessary depending on how you're defining religion. I mean, um, I guess I'm asking not so much in the personal level, but and I'm going to come to the audience next and, and, and open this to Q and A. But I'm curious, you know, we talk when it comes to helping others, okay. when it comes to institutions. Yes, the JCC is not the CC; it's the JCC. Yes, why does it need to be the JCC? What makes it? Or feel free to hand it back to Jonathan, <laughs> and then we're going to get a better question from the audience. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you don't want to go down the rabbit hole of religion versus culture. I don't, you know, I think Chuck and I are two, you know, extremely secular Jews, yet feel incredibly Jewish. Um, I spend a lot of time in synagogues for somebody who's not very religious, so I might as well be religious at this point. Um, you know, but, but you know, the Judaism is so much larger than a religion. It's a civilization, and it's not necessarily... Uh, focused, you know, for us, for, for I know, for, for Chuck and myself, it's, it's the history, it's the tradition, it's the culture. You can't pull religion completely out of Judaism, but it's not necessarily, I don't think that Chuck and I feel that our religious lives or our Jewish lives are really dictated by the supernatural aspect of, of Judaism. You know, I don't, I don't personally don't, you know, I grew up Orthodox and that's, not exactly where I am these days, um, so I, but I feel very Jewish and informed by Jewish values. But that I don't know that I feel that you know that the strict religious aspect of observance is is what is is guiding me at all. Let's have a question. Yes. How has that resolved itself? And my other question is... Let, let's start with that one. Well, let's, there, let's... There were three million Jews in Poland. Now there are a, a, you know, a small fraction. Are, are Jews just a curiosity, and is that why there's the anti-Semitism that's been tamped down? All right, I'll, I'll start with the antipathy between the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic Church, which I'm clearly an expert on. Um, <laughs> the I would say that the bad feelings as much as there have been between Poland and Ukraine since World War II are almost nothing to do with religion and have very much to do with borders. That Poland, you know, part of Ukraine was traditionally Polish, Lviv in that area, Lvov, Lviv, and uh, you know, Poland moved. So, you know, a lot of these things that we see as religious issues are really border issues without going too much back into what President Biden said, but the problem with Jews in the Middle East is not that we're Jews, it's that we're occupied, the, the, the Hamas view and a lot of the strict Islamic view is that that's supposed to be Muslim territory and if you put Jews in there, that's not good. If you put Christians in there, it would also be a problem. So the, the relationship between Poland and Ukraine is a lot more complicated because part of Poland, part of Ukraine historically was Poland, so they don't really see it as, as that. But I don't, I don't think these days the religious aspect of the difference, especially between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, you're not talking about massive differences here. I don't think that that's fueling too much of any disagreement. Uh, but it's not an easy history between Poland and Ukraine in the last century, always. So I that's why uh, I was incredibly positively um, surprised to see the Polish people's reaction to the war in Ukraine and the Polish government reaction as well. Uh, neither of whom have been particularly welcoming of refugees from other places, like the Middle East or the ones who are coming from the Middle East via Belarus. So, but I, I don't see the Orthodox versus the Catholic as, as necessarily these days crucial to the understanding of, of any type of conflict. And do you see the interest in Jewish culture as kind of othering? Oh, the anti-Semitism yeah. aspect of it, of course. So, you know, because the Holocaust happened in Poland, you know, there are two places in the world that every Jew is an expert on. 
right? Every single Jew in the world is an expert on two places. What are those two places? Poland and Israel, right? Israel, it's our homeland. I might never have gone to Israel. I have no desire to go there, whatever. But I can tell you that the line should be drawn and the goal line. Everyone's an expert on Israel. Fair enough, right? And everyone's an expert on Poland, right? People tell me I'm living there 23 years. No, 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 I know the Poles. Have you been there? No. Okay. So it's because of the trauma and because of the tragedy of the Holocaust. It's hard for us to see beyond, not see everything through the prism of the six-year period of the Holocaust. But the Holocaust primarily, so much of it happened in Poland, occupied Poland, as it were, because why? Because that's where the Jews were. Well, why were the Jews there? Why were there 3.6, 3.5, 3.6 million Jews in 1939 if it was a unbroken thousand years of anti-Semitism? The Jews are many things, we're not stupid. We wouldn't have been there in such great numbers. Of course there has been anti-Semitism in Poland, before the war, during the war, and after the war. But Polish Jewish history is like everywhere else in Europe. Ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. And in 1939 it falls off a cliff and we see everything through that trough on the chart. So yes, it's an interesting question if there were 100,000 Jews in Poland today and I did a we did a really good job, all of us doing this, such a good job that there are 100,000 Jews in Poland, how would that affect anti-Semitism? It's a fascinating question. I don't know that we're gonna get there very soon, but I can tell you that there are plenty of other places that don't really have many Jews, that they don't like Jews very much. So what's happening today in Poland, this unique, I would say, in the world, fascination among non-Jews with everything Jewish is something to be nurtured, not something to be incredibly cynical about, but we're skeptical. As Jews, we're skeptical when non-Jews pay a lot of attention to us, right? Throughout our history, it has not worked out well when Jews Let have paid a lot of attention. Let me tell you about that in the South. <laughs> exactly, we wanna be left alone, we get taxed, and this. so yes, there's, there, people love the idea of Jews, people love dead Jews, but what's happening today in Poland is real, and without the focus of non-Jews on Jewish culture and on Jewish history, we wouldn't have the rebirth of Jewish life that we have, so we have to respect it, and we have to nurture it and appreciate it and not be so cynical about it. Another question? Yes. I simply consider myself a photographer. I am Jewish. I'm American. I'm white. I'm I'm old. I'm you know I am what I am, and through through all the and through all the years of, of my experiences, I am what I am. So uh, how I see things is based on my experiences as a human, as a human being. Um, from my upbringing, to my education, to my readings, to my watching movies, to, to everything, to my studying the masters of photography whom I consider the greats. Uh, so everything I do is, is an informed opinion. And, and when I'm making a picture, uh, when I'm photographing something, uh, it's, always, it's always a question of, it's, it's multiple questions. It's why am I, why am I, why do I want to shoot this? Uh, what do I want to show? What do I want to include? What do I want to exclude? Why? 
do I want to influence somebody with this picture? Do I, I'm do, am I doing this for, for what reason? Am I being paid to do this picture? Usually the answer is no. Uh, so it, it's, uh, I'm a photographer, and, and what I like to photograph is, is the, human, the human experience. Uh, and, and Chuck, um, didn't, you, didn't you do a, a Catholic uh, or a, a Pope? Focus. Oh, I did lots of both. <laughs> yeah, photography. <laughs> I, did a lot of I pope. mean, they're. they're <laughs> um, I photographed uh, two popes so far: uh, John Paul II in many countries. Um, uh, well, Khomeini's not a pope. No, but I'm. <laughs> but I, I photographed uh, religious leaders, heads of state, uh, jazz great, jazz, just various various people, um, uh, well known. <laughs> uh, and again, it just comes down to why. Well, what's the purpose? Uh, and what do I want to show? And, but then, and, and like I mentioned before, the person who's looking at that picture, what are they bringing in? What, are they, how are they, what prism are they looking at it through? They're looking at it through their own experience. You can get two different people looking at the same picture and get two different interpretations. So, um, so in answer, hopefully answering your question, I'm simply a photographer, and I, I, I photograph the way the way I feel. Uh, and I'm not the first person to, to first photographer to to um, to speak this way. That you know, you 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 photograph from your heart, really through your brain, and it comes out your eye. When people say you have a good eye. It's like which one? It, it doesn't make any. You know, it, it's you photograph your experiences, and you and you put it out there. And hopefully, if there's a heart to it, then the person receiving it, the person looking at it, will bring their own and get that. If, you, if, if, you're, if I'm photographing something and I can't feel something going on, how do I expect somebody else to feel something? What, uh, yeah, no, you want to add another, to that? No, I think there was another question. question. Yeah, another question, yeah. yes. Go ahead. Oh, here, take this. Oh? John. Oh, okay. Hi, I had a question for you. So. When, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it, it, it changed the world. And, and you at the JCC, you know, jumped in, took on the situation, re really undertook an, an amazing effort and a wonderful effort. And now uh, on October 7th, the world has changed again. And my question to you is, what are you hearing on the ground in Krakow? And how, if at all, is it changing what it is that you do? Yeah, change things very much. For us, um, there are a lot of Israelis that visit Poland, and when the war started, when the attack happened, there were a lot of Israelis in Poland. So we find ourselves now dealing with Israelis that are stranded in Krakow, that were housing, people don't have their prescriptions, people in daycare, that are, they're going to our preschool, um, taking care of providing translation services, logistics, people need a lot of different things when they're stranded somewhere, psychological support as well. We have people that are in, uh, Israelis that are afraid to go back home right now, many with children, young children. So we're, we're supporting them and doing with that. We have about three dozen families that we're now supporting in some sense in Krakow. And, which is another layer to it, there are a lot of Israelis that have European passports. There are a lot of Israelis with Polish passports, but you know, Poland, they're, 27 countries, you can do what you want in the EU work, that are contacting us, um, know that Poland is a safe place, understand current in the environment that it's quite relevant, that there's a small Muslim population in Poland, and seeing what they're seeing and living in Israel, they say, we want to come to Poland. Can you help us? We're, you know, can you provide us with housing? What can your community, what can your institution really means the community, do, do for us until we figure out and get on our feet, but I'm afraid to be here with my children. Which, you know, I'm an Israeli citizen, a Polish citizen, and an American citizen, so it's complicated for me on many levels. Um, on one hand, yes, it breaks your heart that we have a homeland after 2,000 years and people don't feel, Jews don't feel safe living there and want to come back to Poland which is its own level of complication, complicating here. But, you know, for, we'll provide all the services that we can. That's what we do. Certainly, if we respond and we help 
hundreds of thousands of non-Jewish Ukrainians, then it goes without saying that we'll do absolutely everything that we can and everything that is needed to help our Israeli brothers and sisters automatically and we'll figure out, we'll do it and then we'll figure out how to do it afterwards. We jump in and then we figure out how and we generally that works somehow. Um, although it drives my staff crazy, it's not the way polls really think, they don't like that, but I'm like, yes, and then oh, we'll figure it out. Um, I think that there is a lesson there. I think that there is something interesting about this, seeing that you know, if you look at Poland without letting the Holocaust totally determine your view, then it's not so strange that a country with a thousand years of Jewish history is once again a nurturing good environment for Jews. And it is in all of our interest to see, try to see, although it's difficult, and if you have survivor parents, you know, relatives, you know, for all of us, it's maybe even more difficult the closer survivors are to you, although they're close to all of us, um, to try to see Poland beyond only a place of Jewish death, when it is now a place of Jewish life, a place of resurgent, organic Jewish life, and once again, sad for very sad reasons, but, you know, I'm happy that my community can provide refuge to Israelis that need it and you know, let as many come as want to come and then they can go back or stay and Jews should live wherever they want and Poland should be one of the places that they should live because it's a good place to live these days. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, sorry. Well, I have a friend and uh, family in Poland and so we go back every year. And one of the things I did want to point out particularly is that uh, when the Ukrainian uh, refugee influx came into Poland, and this was uh, over two million people, and at least a million of which remain in Poland. The others went on to other places in the EU. And well, closer to two million now. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was not the government that was just voted out of office, peace, that did anything for the refugees. It was the local people it's opening not, uh, their own homes to, uh, and me. the local governments of the progressive uh, parts. I, I, I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll, you'll forgive me for, for disagreeing with you strongly. Um, as someone who is very happy with the current uh, the election result, very happy, mm -hmm. and someone who doesn't, uh, ne didn't necessarily agree with the previous peace, law and justice government about almost anything, I will say that they were very, very good on Ukraine. And we have to give them credit for creating a national policy which allowed the Ukrainians to have all the rights of Polish citizens besides voting. So that meant you can send your kids to school for free. You had free access to public health. Um, the first days of the war, they let the little things that they didn't have to do, which surprised me. For example, they let Ukrainians bring their pets across the border. The border between Poland and Ukraine is the border between Ukraine and the European Union. And there are very strict rules about quarantine and things, and they let these poor people coming across with, with their pets. So you won't hear me saying, agreeing with anything the previous government did, issues, a whole range of issues, but I don't think it's fair not to give them credit where credit is due, and I think that they performed shockingly, remarkably well when it came to the Ukrainian refugees. So uh, you use the word nurturing, and you know, you nurture your kids and you nurture things you plant, et cetera. At what point do you think that the Polish Jewish community in your city is where there's a critical mass and it could be self-sustaining and grow? And, and I wonder uh, if you have any feelings about what's going on in Germany, the German Jewish community as well. Yeah, so I don't think our community is there yet. I think that we have a ways to go. You know, in terms of infrastructure, we have one, the only formal Jewish education is our preschool and Chabad just started a first grade, which is probably the rabbi's kids, which is like four or five and then like two more. So, you know, we're not, we're not where we need to be in terms of infrastructure, um, but we're on our way. Warsaw is closer to, uh, I don't wanna say a normal, Poland is far from normal in many ways, but. Warsaw looks more like a normal Jewish community than Krakow does in terms of more organizations offering different things. In Krakow, we are doing almost everything, which in some ways is great that we're doing that, but it's 
a healthier community that has you know, different organizations carrying the load as opposed to one, no matter how wonderful that organization may be. Um, but I think what's, you, you ask a very interesting question because if you're not aware, I don't know if everyone's very aware of what the German Jewish community looks like today, you have probably 250,000, maybe 300,000 Jews living in Germany. That's 50,000 Israelis, probably a few thousand local German Jews who somehow survived or came back, and the vast majority are Jews from the former Soviet Union, right? You walk around Jewish Germany, everyone's speaking Russian. And I think that Poland was already on, your, on that path. Starting in 2014, a lot of Ukrainians came to Poland and stayed. So a quarter of our young people, before this war, before this part of the war, before Putin's invasion in 2022, um, continuation of his invasion, really, but before February 2022, a quarter of our students were Ukrainian, and now half of our students are Ukrainian. I think that Poland, in my guess, if I had to look in the crystal ball and say what will Polish Jewish community look like in 20 years, I would say that it would very much follow the path of Germany, which is, what, think about, it. why are you all here if you're Jewish? None of you were here 200 years ago. You're here because it wasn't, life wasn't good somewhere, and your ancestors picked up, or you picked up, and went somewhere else. That's what we do. And if Poland continues to be a stable place with a strong economy, decent economy, and a reasonable environment for Jews with a strong Jewish history, right? It's not Madagascar, some place with no Jewish history. Then Jews will find their way there when they are leaving other places. Um, and that's what we're. That's what we're. That's what we saw in Germany. And that's what we'll see in Poland. What we need to do as a Jewish people is to get ahead of that, to be proactive and not reactive, to make sure organizations like ours and others are able to help that influx of people that's on its way and that will continue. And again, this is something to celebrate. The idea of a place that within living memory was a graveyard, was the worst place to be Jewish in the history of Jews and is now a welcoming, even nurturing place of Jews and non-Jews working together. This is a, a victory of the Jewish people. We'll take one more. If we can be a quick question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll end it up. Just quickly, do you work with St. Mary's in Krakow? Or, and any other churches, do they work with you on we projects? We work with not individual churches as much as with the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. we, do, we do a lot of projects. We just, I mean, it's not exactly answering, but so yes, but one of our largest uh, donors now for our, for our work with Ukraine is the Mormon Church, uh, which has taken a lar real amazing interest in what we're doing. And uh, yeah, so we work with all different organizations with different, with the church overall, but not necessarily with an individual. I just want to Church. say the four of us visited Krakow in August. Oh. You were gone. You were raising money elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and what you should see this place. Oh, my God. The food bank. The in, It was just wonderful. You came to our what, JCC? Yes. Oh, sure did. Oh, good. good. Twice. <laughs> oh, nice. Mateusz took us on a tour. Very nice. But it it just a splendid job that you're doing. Seriously. Thank Everybody you, right. there. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry I missed you. You were there in 2018, I think. Really? That long? 19 or 18 or 19. I just want to give these gentlemen a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Chuck, Jonathan, it was really wonderful to speak with you, and thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Central Synagogue. Thank you, yes. And thank you, everyone. I just wanted to let you know that the exhibition, um, Chuck's Photography, is going to be up until November 15th. You can take a quick peek now, but we're going to really push you out before 9 o'clock. Um, and you can also see it on Wednesdays between 12.30 and 2 when we have our public open hours here at the synagogue. Um, and after Friday night services, if you come down for the own egg. So thank you for coming, um, and we hope to see you come back for uh, future exhibitions. <laughs>